I always think if she doesn't want to jump my bones, Mm -hmm. you know, when she sees me take my shirt off, she doesn't really want me. Mm -hmm. Well, she just may not be built that way. She may just be built with a responsive libido and that's perfectly fine. Um, And don't feel like it's a personal insult. You're listening to Get Your Marriage On, the fun and spicy podcast, bringing you new tools and fresh ideas so that you can be the sexiest couple you know. Today's podcast is for the husbands out there that want to make sex great. There's far more to just the mechanics and geometry of sex to being a good lover. There's romance, creating exciting erotic context, sharing your mental load with your wife, and so much more that goes into making love, not with just your body, but with your heart too. And this might just be my experience as a man, but we men don't get very much helpful education on how to be a good lover. So I'm excited to have Keith Gregor alongside with his wife, Sheila, author of The Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex on my podcast today. I've read this book and it's excellent. Keith and Sheila have been writing about sex in marriage for 10 years and they're respected for their approach in their easy-to-relate-to and humorous style towards improving sex and marriage. Be sure to listen to the very end of this episode because I'm giving away copies of their books, The Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex and the revamped The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex, and those details are after our interview. And one more important announcement. I'm putting on a romantic retreat for couples all about embracing your sexual intimacy this October 13 through 16. Imagine a fun and relaxing three-day, three-night retreat in the mountains, surrounded by a lake, with you and your spouse in a cozy cabin, just the two of you. Not only that, there's excellent instruction, and you can get some specific help on how you can apply the things you're learning right into your marriage so you can walk away with meaningful growth and a deeper connection in your marriage. There's also good food, too, I gotta say. Details are on my website at getyourmarriageon.com slash couples retreat, or you can find it in my menu, couples retreat. Spots are filling up fast, so be sure to claim your spot today. Keith and Sheila, it is such an honor to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, we just, we love being here. This is great. That's great. So I'd like to start off with a little bit of foreplay to introduce you to my audience. Mm-hmm. So tell me about a time when you got caught. So you want me to tell it or do you want sure, to Sure, go for so, it. So uh, we, one of the things we talk about at uh, marriage conferences when we talk about sexual intimacy is making sure your room is private and installing a lock on your door. Uh-huh. Very uh, important. And we tell the story of, of how we were having a really good time one night together and things are going really well. And then we heard the little pitter patter of feet in the hallway outside and that, you know, your heart comes up in your throat like, oh, oh, and they got to walk in. And then we heard the little hand on the door, ticket, 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 but it was locked. We'd remember to lock the door. We were like, Whew. so we stopped and we like told our daughter, can you say your name? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Go back to bed, Katie. <laughs> she goes, or you know, we said the door is locked, Katie. She said, okay. And we heard the pattern feet go off. We thought, oh, problem solved. Back crazy. to business. Right? <laughs> and then, you know, that's when we learned that five years old is old enough to know how to pick a lock. Um, <laughs> because she <laughs> put her pattern back to her room and got a coat hanger and bent it out like she'd seen me do when she locked her sister, <laughs> locked her, her and her sister inside the bathroom uh-huh. before. <laughs> Yeah. Crisis was averted. The sheets were all where they should be. And it was fine. We didn't scar her for life. (laughs) Uh, That's great. That's great. I'm glad uh, that it could have ended a whole lot worse. (laughs) So I am fans of your two new books that you published. Now, uh, for those that know me, I talk about the good girl's guide to great sex often, because Mm -hmm. when my wife and I were really learning about sexual intimacy for us for the first time after been married for so many years, we were like so timid. We went online and like, okay, it's got to be something Christian and something within (laughs) minor values. And we read this blog post of this newlywed that talked about how this book really helped her prepare for marriage and like, perfect. Amazon add to cart. Two days later, it shows up. And I read that entire book in one sitting, like cover to cover. My wife had fallen asleep and I stayed up probably 4 a.m. to finish the book. And like, this is such a good book. And then we went on to read other books too. And it's really cool that you've done a refresh of it. It's completely revamped. Yeah. And there's a companion book for husbands now, which I'm so grateful for because there wasn't a guide for guys, only for (laughs) girls at the time. So uh, anyway, I want to talk about a few of these things, but really dive into like, Keith, why did you write this book? 
Uh, because Sheila told me to. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, we always joke about how like Sheila's been writing about sex for like over 10 years now. And I've had this job as a pediatrician. Um, and then she sort of said one day, wouldn't you like to be involved with this with me? And I'm like, yeah, I probably should because, you know, you can give the, the, the balance perspective. And so, uh, so yeah, we've always wanted to sort of write something for guys for a while now. And, and so she asked if I'd be interested in doing that. And I said, yeah, of course, I'd be quite, quite happy to do that. But the, I think that there's a lot of teaching out there about sexuality that basically gives guys kind of a pass. Like it doesn't really challenge men to be good lovers. Um, there's a lot of stuff about how women need to have sex more. Um, and then men realize that they don't really like duty sex where their wife feels like she has to. Mm -hmm. So then we tell women have sex more and enjoy it <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to telling men how to be good lovers. And so that's what we really wanted to do with this book is we wanted to write a book where guys, you can learn to really rock your wife's world uh, mm -hmm. rather than just feeling like you're a good lover, be a good lover. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those, um, unhelpful teachings then like what are you address some of them but can you tell us maybe one or two of, of yeah, what i think one of, the, that are helpful. one of the big ones is men need sex and women don't so you know in the book love and respect for instance which is the most commonly used marriage curriculum in north american churches emerson Egrich says if your husband is typical he has a need you don't have Okay. And that's, that's kind of throughout our culture is this idea that guys need sex and what women really need is emotional connection. Uh -huh. It's a little you know, condescending, all, isn't it? Yeah. Like all they need is talking. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wonder, do these people know about self-fulfilling prophecies? Because if you tell women enough, you don't like sex, you don't want sex. All you really want is the talking. And then they wonder why is it that women don't want sex? <laughs> or you're a woman that actually likes sex and you feel really out of the, out of, like, you yes. feel like that's wrong. Yeah. Or yes. if you're a woman and you, you have a really high sex drive and you're married to a guy with just like a normal sex drive and you start to think that there's something wrong with him. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why did I marry? Cause he's supposed to be all over me and he's not. <laughs> and I've talked to so many women who had to go to counseling in the uh -huh. first couple of years of marriage simply because they had normal sex drives, but in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one, I think, I think another one is, um, is the idea that, that guys are obligated or the women are obligated to give men sex and that what men really need is just physical release. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not what guys need. Guys need intimacy too. Absolutely. You know, yeah. guys need emotional connection too. And I think so often what's happened is we've encouraged men to put a lot of their emotional needs and channel them into sex as mm -hmm. opposed to expressing them as proper emotional needs. And it really makes sex seem kind of shallow, like they're using her because they haven't really opened up to her yet. And so let's see sex, not just as something physical, but as something which is emotional and spiritual and physical all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And it's very possible to have sexual desires, but out of weakness, because you look at it as reassurance mm -hmm. yes. either way, right? For her, it might be, oh, he's, you know, pursuing me. Let's pretend that's, that's yes. the dynamic. And when he stops pursuing, she now doesn't feel as because she depended on that sex to make her feel good. And mm -hmm. the opposite too, like, oh, she's not really into this. And so he feels bad about himself. So he like pursues even more. <laughs> yes. Mm. And that's what you're addressing. Let's not do this out of yeah. weakness. Let's do this out of strength, which yeah. requires a lot of courage, you know, yeah. emotional connection as well. And other things too. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of men take see sex as a shortcut. Um, and so rather than building a strong, intimate relationship with their wife, of which sex is a part, they see sex as a way of validating themselves as a man. You know, sex is what makes me feel like a man, mm -hmm. as opposed to feeling like a man in yourself and being secure in yourself and saying, hey, how can I, what can I bring to my wife sexually? You know, that's, that's the kind of mind shift we want people yeah. to try and get. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. Okay. So let's talk about how to be a good lover then. <laughs> uh, you talk a lot about romance. Can we, can you give us a romance lesson, Keith? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think the first thing we talk about in the book that I don't see anywhere else in the Christian church is we talk about the fact that like men might want romance too. I, I never <laughs> oh, yeah. see that anywhere Absolutely. else. Right? Uh -huh. We define romance. Romance is basically when you say to the other person, you matter. Um, 
I care about you, your, your desires, your interests matter. And I want to show that I love you by honoring them. So, you know, what are the things that make you feel special and loved and cared for? You know, so one of the big things with our marriage is um, Sheila came to me at one point and said, you know, it would be really great if we started doing sweetheart. And I said, what, what? She goes, we started doing ballroom dancing. And I said, Oh, that'd be awesome. (laughs) You didn't mean it though. (laughs) Well, I wanted to mean it so badly, (laughs) you know, but for her, like dancing and being close and stuff was just such an incredible way to feel connected. Uh Um, And so I I said, you know what, if this is going to make you feel special and cared for and pursued and, and all those wonderful things. And yeah, I'm, I'm totally into it. I'm going to have two left feet. I'm sure I'm not gonna be very good at it. I'm gonna take a lot of work. Um, but you know, her preferences matter to me. And the same thing with Sheila, like, you know, one of the things I say is when I come home from work, you know, it's very romantic for me. If you get up from what you're doing, come give me a kiss and just say, oh, I'm glad you're home or that sort of thing. And, and when she does that for me, I just, I feel like 10 feet tall. It's just amazing. And, and these things, if you do these things all day long through the day, they just build such a solid foundation of, mm-hmm. of emotional and even spiritual intimacy Mm-hmm. that the physical part of stuff just becomes so much better because vulnerability and closeness are the keys. To, they're the real aphrodisiacs. They're the keys to like amazing sex. Yeah. Hey, Sheila, what do you have to add to that? <laughs> I, I think too, um, when we think about romance, we think too much about chocolates and flowers. Uh-huh or Valentine's day or mother's day or, and or love songs. Like uh-huh. Um, <laughs> chocolates are great by the way, like yeah. I'm, I'm all for chocolate, but it's sometimes it's just listening. It's just showing that you value your, your spouse. And that's what we often forget is you just need to put in a little bit of work. We have one thing that I, if you take nothing else in this podcast, please remember this, cause this is a great thing to do together. Okay. So everyone listen in. Um, at the end of the day, share your two emotional moments from your day together. Okay. So share the one time that you felt the most in the groove, like God was working through me. I I just felt on fire and then share the time you felt the most defeated and discouraged. Just those two moments. And when, you, and lows. Share, when you share, the, yeah, yeah. Except more emotional because your high might be, I won the lottery, (laughs) but there might've been a time where like, I was mentoring this, this kid that, that I teach. And she told me this and that, like, that really built me up. Like there might've been a different emotional moment where you were the most in the groove. So it's not, it's not as much like the best thing that happened to me. It was like the time I was the most on fire, you know? <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Cause like uh, something bad, well, someone could have rear-ended your car and that's bad, but maybe the most emotionally difficult time was when your boss said something to you that really cut you down. And now you're wondering, you know, about your whole self-esteem. Like, <laughs> so it's not necessarily the worst and best. It's like, it's like you're the emotional moment uh, where you're the most in the groove or the most defeated. And, you know, we started doing that and I started to realize that my most defeated moment was always the same. Like five days in a row, it was when I checked my email. And that was when I realized I need to hire someone to do my email for me because this is really, you know, so you learn stuff about yourself too. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's self-awareness is part of it. But the other thing is, is that especially, and again, I don't mean to sound too sexist here, but especially guys, guys often have a hard time knowing how to share their feelings and how to build emotional depth Mm -hmm. and intimacy and this is a really easy way to do it it's not intimidating you know you can think of the time of the day where you felt the most successful encouraged and you can think of the time you felt the most discouraged and 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 had a hard time and it's a very like when you when you take five minutes when you come in and someone says what did you do today or how was your day we often say it was fine it was normal i had a bunch of client meetings you know (laughs) and so so you don't really connect so this is just a really quick way to connect with each other and when you feel that emotional connection it really does build desire yeah and that can be romantic too just sharing how much you know what things impact you Mm -hmm. can be very romantic they really bond you together Mm -hmm. yeah i i want to do a little deeper dive on this because i think this is super important as i coach other men and couples uh it seems like understanding one's own emotional uh being aware of their own emotions is a real struggle partially because maybe the way men are socialized in our culture Mm -hmm. and you're not allowed to feel emotion unless it's anger you can be angry that's okay (laughs) but other emotions like 
those are kind of really hard to identify or put words to. And so mm -hmm. I think uh, this is a good practice probably for that. And yeah, and the more, the more you do it, the more you start looking for things in the day too that you're going to share. And that does help you start to identify when, okay, actually, I'm not feeling good right now. <laughs> like this is one of those moments I might want to share. So it, it, it does help with self-awareness as well. And when you, when you understand yourself better emotionally, you have more to share too, and you're going to feel closer. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. And it's a step of, like you said, labeling learning to label those emotions is a very, very important step that frankly, a lot of, again, I, I sound sexist mm -hmm. because it can be women too, but particularly men have a hard time labeling emotions. And the great thing is if you learn to label emotions, that's the first step. The next step is to realize in the moment what you're feeling and then what am I going to do with that? Because that's emotional maturity. Like it's not being emotionally mature. doesn't mean never being angry. It means recognizing when you're angry and having the ability in that moment to say, okay, I'm angry. What am I going to do with that? Mm -hmm. Right. Or I'm, or I'm really excited. What am I going to do with that? Or, or whatever emotion it is. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's really important about emotional health. Yeah. Big switch happened to me in my parenting when I realized I'm using anger as a tool to control mm -hmm. another person to get the behavior I wanted out of them. Mm -hmm. And it made me stop and think, is anger the right tool to use right now? Sometimes it might be, but like mm -hmm. most of the time in my situation, yeah. no, there are other tools I could use better. When I saw anger as just a, one of many tools, like, oh, I could use that emotion if I want to, but there's all these other emotions I could employ instead. So yeah, yeah it's, it's being in tune with that. Yeah. And when it comes to parenting, dude, this is nothing to do with marriage or sex, just an aside, <laughs> but a really, really, quick, really, really, really quick tip, yeah. especially with boys. You do this with both your kids, but it's so important with boys because boys are often not taught how to identify emotions. When your two, three, four-year-old son is upset, say, wow, you look frustrated. You must be frustrated because of this. Or, wow, you sound angry, you know, or yes, you're sad because we're leaving the park. When we have to leave the park, that's sad, you know, but like help like name their emotions and that can really help. Mm -hmm. ah, very good. Great tip. <laughs> Love it. Yep. <laughs> okay. I like how you all say sex starts in the kitchen. Well, sort of, <laughs> and I, I, I like it when sex starts in the kitchen personally, but, like, <laughs> but what do you really mean by that? And how can this tie into the whole idea of yeah. being a good lover? Well, there's, there's two ways that that can be misinterpreted. The first is that we think it means like, you know, clear, clear the dishes off the countertop because you know, it's going to happen. <laughs> right. Uh <-huh. laughs> but that's, that's not what people usually mean. People usually mean the idea of, well, if you as a guy want to get lucky in the bedroom, you need to be helping out in other rooms during the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and although, you know, I am very much in favor of men being involved with the household tasks and, and that sort of thing. And I am that sort of thing. The way we portray it makes it sound like it's kind of like a transaction. Like if I unload the dishwasher, I'm paying you for sex, which is really disgusting to most women. Right. And I think that a lot of men need to realize that. So yeah, helping out and being part of, you know, daily family life is really important to have a good sex life, but not when you're doing it out of that sense of this will now obligate her to be nicer to me later on. If that makes sense. Yeah. To here's it, why oh. it matters. So many women, if you, if you talk to women, why is it that you don't want sex? Almost the number one reason will be exhaustion. They're tired and they just have too much going on in their heads. Um, and we, we included a story in the book about, I think we called them Sandra and Mark, but let's say mm -hmm. that one Saturday morning, Mark tells Sandra, go out, you know, go to the gym, go to a coffee shop, have a morning to yourself. I've got the kids. And she does. She has an amazing time. She gets back. And Mark is all happy because he took the kids out for a bike ride. He made this amazing waffle breakfast. And so he's really proud of himself. But the present, but as Sandra goes into the kitchen, she sees the present for the birthday party they're due at at, full, at two is still on the counter and hasn't been wrapped. And then she notices that, you know, her son's science project is still on the dining room table. They haven't done anything on it and it's due on Tuesday and Sunday. They've got church all day. Plus they've got people coming over. There's no time to do it tomorrow. Like it needed to be done today. And Jane needed to practice her piano, which is normally done on Saturday mornings. And if Janie doesn't get the piano practice done when the recital is like on Thursday, we're going to be in trouble. The piano teacher's going to be in. <laughs> and so all of a sudden she's upset at Mark because he didn't do all of these things. And Mark's like, but but I gave you a morning off 
And she's saying, yes, but you didn't do all of these things I would have done. So he feels like she's angry at him for being nice to her. Mm -hmm. Uh And he doesn't realize that all he did was just he didn't give her anything. He just delayed all the work she she got home. (laughs) Yeah. And and this is what we this is a concept called mental load. And Eve Rodsky talked about it in her book for Fair Play, which is great. And, And I've talked about it on my blog before. But mental load is is when women and it's usually women they carry all of the details of everything that needs to be done in the house so all the doctor's appointments all the birthday cards that need to be sent all the birthday presents like everyone's schedule it's all in her head and it's <laughs> well invisible it's invisible it's all too. invisible yeah right. all the housework all the laundry etc and because of that she just is having this incredible incredible load on her and what researchers are wondering is do women actually have lower libidos as a whole than men or have they just been artificially lowered because of, as we have shown some of the bad teachings, but also because of this mental load. And so if guys can just say, you know what? I own laundry. You never have to think about laundry. I do all the laundry. I get the laundry. I do the laundry. I put the laundry away. I realize when we're running out of laundry detergent, I buy the laundry detergent. Like I own everything to do with laundry and you never have to think about it. That's how you take on mental load. (laughs) Because a lot of guys instead, they sort of say, well, I'm happy to help out. Give me a list. Mm -hmm. And they think they're heroes now because Mm -hmm. give me the list. And so, and so then they feel like they're working so hard and they're not getting any credit. But it's because, you know, she still has to make the list. She still has to check to make sure you got everything on the list. She still has to, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then she has to take, take your text when you're at the grocery store saying, do you want this brand or that brand? Like, and like, guys, you know, if instead of having a bunch of lists for a bunch of different chores, if you just said some of the things in the household, I'm just going to take off your plate entirely. Like you could probably get a lot more, you cause a lot more harmony in your household. If instead of helping out everywhere, if you just took one or two big areas and said, Hey, let me just own this mm-hmm. and uh, I'll do it my way. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll take your input because you've done it. Bef- you've done it before. And I want to learn from you about how to do it well, but then I'm just going to own it and we'll just get it done and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. And that honestly is a huge way to boost libido because it just takes a lot of the mental stuff out, you know, out so that she doesn't have all these things in her head at the end of the day. Yeah. How, have you two, oh, how have you Go two ahead. shared your mental load? Um, <laughs> well, this is funny because when we, our, our co- her cousin was reading the book um, Fair Play, and uh-huh. we were there at their house um, visiting. Uh, and then uh, she said, "Oh my gosh, you're doing what's in this book called Fair Play that I'm reading." <laughs> she watched us, and she said, "You guys are doing Fair Play." So basically, what happened was um, Sheila called out to me across the room saying, "Oh, I got this thing about this. We were going on a vacation, and there's some notification about something need to be booked." And Sheila yelled at me and said, "You know." I got this notification. I said, yep, no, I got it. It's all taken care of because in our household, like the vacation stuff, like planning everything flights. Well, Sheila uh, has a sec has a, has an assistant that helps with this stuff too. But, but like all the details of stuff, I take care of all that kind of stuff. And she just has to pack and go. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just something we do. I, I just, I yeah. organize those things. We we've done it differently over the years, depending on who's working yeah. more. Like Keith does more now. He he completely owns the laundry. He completely owns the finances. He completely owns the travel, um, and I completely own the cooking and you know a lot and a lot of those other sorts of things. So yeah, we just we just split things up. And the nice thing is that I don't have to worry about it. The stuff that isn't on my plate, and it does give you a lot more mental energy. Yeah. Now, I think the other person still needs to be aware of what's going on. Like, you don't want a person to have like no idea of the finances, yeah, like, <laughs> or no idea of like things because mm-hmm. you know, like every once in a while you have to pitch in help. So, but mm-hmm. the concept of owning something, you know, soup to nuts, <laughs> like from the beginning of the, of the pro- task till the very end, um, mm-hmm. it's important. I have an entire podcast episode about sharing the mental load with Dr. Morgan oh. Cutlip. Which oh, I'll probably super. link in the show notes here, but we've oh, yeah, that's been a great. deep dive on that. So yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So yeah, just a practical quick thing I was going to say is for guys too, sometimes it doesn't have to mean doing stuff, but even just giving your wife the chance to vent, talking mm-hmm. about all the things that are on her plate. Maybe she doesn't want sex because she can't relax because she's got too much stuff going on. Just having a nice walk and talking about what are you worried about? What things are you mm-hmm. holding mentally right now? You know, even if you don't help with them, just to let her get them out can help too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great, great advice. Thank you. Keith, any other top mistakes you see men make in their attitude or approach towards sex when they approach their wives? Yeah, uh, well, we'll start with true confessions, <laughs> <laughs> right? right? 
is is I, I think a lot of guys come into sex with the menta- with a sort of an entitlement mentality, mm-hmm. right? It gives back to the whole idea that we think that sex is for men. Mm-hmm. Uh, and especially in the Christian world, we talk about waiting till you're married. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's all you need to do is wait till you're married and then everything will be awesome, right? So that's your job as a guy, wait till you're married and then that's it. And so once you're married, everything will be amazing. And what happened with Sheila and I, we share about it in our book and we share about it in her her blog a lot is, you know, things didn't go awesome when we first got married. Sheila mm-hmm. suffered from vaginismus, which is a condition where, you know, sex is painful for women. Christian women suffer from it twice as much as the general population. It's a very mm-hmm. common thing in, in conservative religious circles. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that made sex really difficult for us. And unfortunately, my mentality wasn't, oh my gosh, how horrible is this for my wife? My mentality was, but what, what about me? Like, but this means I don't get sex. And mm-hmm. I had a terrible attitude. Uh, and I put so much pressure on her um, in this area when I should have given, should have stepped back and let her recover and heal and figure out what it was. But instead, because I had this mindset, men's mindset, but instead, because I had this mindset that this is something that once I got married, it was going to be amazing. Now, when it was an amazing, I felt like I had been robbed. Like I didn't, I wasn't getting what I was supposed to get. And it was, it, it's, I, I'm ashamed to say it now, but that's honestly how I felt. And so basically I would just say to guys, one of the big top mistakes is don't think of sex as something that is for you. Think of it as something that's for the two of you as a couple. Mm-hmm. I think, in, I think another problem that guys often get into, well, actually that we both can get into is that we think his experience of sex is the default. Mm -hmm. And then when women don't experience sex in the same way, it means she's broken in some way. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example, some data that shows that. So for our books, uh, they're based on our surveys of 25,000 people. So very, very large surveys. And we asked both men and women, does he do enough foreplay? Mm -hmm. When women frequently reach orgasm, both men and women say at around 90%, yes, he does enough foreplay, which totally makes sense. She's having an orgasm. He does enough foreplay. Way to go. But when women don't re- reach orgasm, 71% of guys still say they do enough foreplay. <laughs> and so do 52% of women. Oh. Which Oops. makes us wonder, uh-huh. like, enough for what? <laughs> right. No, clearly not enough. Let's but define foreplay I... real quick, just, just, just to make it really clear what you're talking about. Yeah. So, and, and actually we might get into that a little bit more later, but in another, cause I'd love to talk about the sexual response cycle as well, but, but we think that intercourse is the main thing. Mm -hmm. And then anything that you do leading up to intercourse is kind of like an extra or a bonus. So if you're kissing, if you're rubbing each other, if you're, if you're petting each other, oral sex, manual sex, anything like that, those are all elements of foreplay and they're seen as extra Gotcha. because sex is intercourse. We don't that's, think that's, that's, that's true. Yeah, that's we don't not what think we that's think. True. <laughs> yes, that's what's uh-huh. taught, right? <laughs> but that's uh-huh. often what's taught. And so here's a couple, and they think they're supposed to have sex, by which they mean have intercourse. Uh-huh. So they have intercourse when she's not that aroused. It doesn't feel that good for her, but he loves it. And so the assumption is he's sexual and she's not. Ah, right. Because sex works for him and it doesn't work for her. Mm-hmm. because intercourse is sex and it's supposed to be this great thing that God made for us to enjoy. And she's not enjoying it. Mm-hmm. And so there must be something wrong with her. And a lot of women feel broken. That's one of the most common adjectives that women tell me. Like, I think my clitoris is broken. <laughs> I think my vagina is broken. like, it just doesn't work. And often men think the same thing. And so when women say, yeah, he doesn't have foreplay, even though I'm not reaching orgasm, Often what it means is she just thinks, well, there's no, there's no hope. Uh-huh. Like he's trying, he's rubbing, but I'm not feeling anything. I hear that all the time too. Like he is rubbing my clitoris, but it doesn't feel like anything. Mm-hmm. And we think what's going on is that they don't understand the sexual response cycle. Mm-hmm. And we go into this in detail in the book, but if she's going to get to orgasm and if he's going to get to orgasm, physiologically, your body is going to go through several distinct stages leading up to orgasm, you know, excitement, where your heart rate starts to go up a little bit, you start to get a little tingly, your breathing starts to get a little faster, arousal, where um, she gets lubricated, you increased know, she, blood flow. Uh huh. Yeah, all of uh-huh. that stuff, uh-huh. you know, plateau, which is where you're almost an orgasm and then orgasm. And the thing is, excitement and arousal 
look very similar for men. They're not that similar for women. You know, for guys, you get an erection, you're ready to go. For women, excitement isn't necessarily when you're super aroused. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And for some women, the excitement phase takes a long time. You need to spend a lot of time kissing and touching. But if when she's not even excited, if he just goes right for the clitoris, it feels like a pap smear. Okay. (laughs) It feels yucky. It feels invasive. It's like, what is he doing? Like it just, it doesn't even feel good. And that's what happens is we read all these books about how manual stimulation works and how she just wants her clitoris rubbed. And so he rubs her clitoris when there's nothing, there's no excitement going on here. (laughs) Prematurely. She's not ready for that kind of touch yet. Yeah, exactly. And then, and nothing happens and she figures, well, I'm broken. And, you know, maybe he tries that for two or three minutes and then she's like, no, it's okay. We can just go ahead. Mm -hmm. And so has he done enough foreplay? Well, yeah, he tried, but it didn't work. And so the problem is with me. And we think that's what's going on a lot. That's one of the reasons why the way that we just love your, um, intimately us app because it makes foreplay such a drawn out fun experience so uh-huh. that you can actually make it a game all those stages. <laughs> yeah. well, and because guys need to realize that excitement well, even when we say excitement i think a lot of men can misunderstand that right because they think excitement they think sexual excitement right. but excitement you know in that phase that first phase we're talking about is just you know the tingles right like like running your hand down the that your fingers down the inside of her arm uh-huh. or you know nibbling on her earlobe or you know just kind of you know like kissing deeply that kind of stuff like things that a lot of guys don't think of as sexual uh-huh. um but they're still exciting that's what she needs she needs that to get ready and then she moves into the arousal phase and a lot of guys try and jump past excitement right into arousal like if i just start you know giving everything a little rub it'll it'll make her you know go through the, go to the moon. You know, it's, it doesn't work that way. We get all kinds of emails saying, please tell my husband that grabbing my butt when I'm doing dishes is not sexual, is not foreplay. Like <laughs> it's, it's not the way it works. You know, no, no, no. guys need to realize that it, it's, it's done a very specific order. Now it can be very short. Some women, the excitement phase mm-hmm. can be okay. I'm ready. Let's get through the good stuff, you know, <laughs> or whatever, you know, like, it's all good stuff. I shouldn't say that, but, uh-huh. but, you know, like, um, but, but, but understanding that you need to slow down and um and honor the way that her body is made as opposed to saying that well you should be like a man and you should be ready to go no that's just not right and even if she takes longer it doesn't mean she's not as sexual yeah this is the big thing i want people to understand um when we looked at how women feel after sex if they started sex not aroused but confident they were going to get there versus women who started sex when they were aroused, like started a sexual encounter when they were aroused, as long as they reached orgasm, their feelings afterwards were the same, the same Mm -hmm. blissfulness, the same relaxation, the same um, intimacy. And so it's, it's not about how quickly she, she goes through the cycle at all, or whether she is completely wanting you at the very beginning and whether she's totally panting. The only issue is, is she confident she's going to get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm learning from you how important it is to create that context. I'm going to use the word erotic context Mm -hmm. as excitement. Mm -hmm. Like it's the dancing, the, it's the, like what we talked about earlier, the, just you, it's the messages of you matter to me, like creating that context is the excitement, right? It's the, you're beautiful to me. And I desire you for you, who you are, those things add to that excitement. We forget that. Because we jump yes. right. Yes, this, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The second thing too, I, I think, and tell me what you think about this is we, we take such a male centric approach towards sex that we say she takes a long time when mm, if yes. it were another real, another world where it was more female centric, she'd be normal. And we go, men, you're too fast. Like, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Right. Yes. <laughs> we forget that. It's yes. relative to a man. She's taking a long time when she's perfectly normal. That's mm. the way it's supposed to be. That's the standard. And it's just that men are faster too. We forget yeah. that. So I think we need to like, not uh, worry that she takes 25 or 30 minutes mm-hmm. to get to that of foreplay to get to enough arousal for her mm-hmm. to, ex- you know, reach plateau and climax that you said, because that's, the norm that's supposed to be that way. It's there's yes. nothing wrong with that. It's just that because he's so fast, you got to 
slow yeah. him down. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> absolutely. And uh-huh. we actually, we have some se- st- sections of the book where we talk about like how you can slow things down and, yeah. and give enough uh-huh. time as a yeah, guy too. That. That's uh-huh. very practical in there. Mm-hmm. I think one of the big things, you know, about things is libido too, right? We don't recognize that um, it's not a male female thing completely, but there's the idea of a responsive libido versus a spontaneous libido. Um, and so we talked about excitement and arousal uh, earlier, but we didn't talk about desire. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for most men, desire precedes it all. So they desire sex, they start to get excited, then they get aroused and then, you know, plateau and climax. Mm-hmm. Whereas for women, a lot of times the desire comes after a little bit of excitement. Mm-hmm. And it's not always the case. There are, there are men who are, who are responsive libido and women who are spontaneous libido, mm-hmm. but it is sort of a general trend. And I think the reason that we need to mention it is for two things is number one is if you're a woman who really enjoys sex and you know, you know, when you have sex with your husband, it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to feel amazing, but you don't really initiate that much. But when he starts things, you are really excited and you're like, let's do this. This is awesome. There's nothing wrong with you. You just have a responsive libido, right? Right. And 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 for guys, if your wife is like that, like that doesn't mean she doesn't want you. A lot of guys think if she doesn't want to jump my bones, mm-hmm. you know, when she sees me take my shirt off, she doesn't really want me. Mm-hmm. Well, she just may not be built that way. She may just be built with a responsive libido and that's perfectly fine. Um, and don't feel like it's a personal insult to you that she doesn't find you attractive. Mm-hmm. 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 And I think too, if women are on the more responsive end, guys will, will often say, well, do you want to have sex tonight? Like I need to know so that I don't get upset later. And the problem is she actually (laughs) doesn't know if she's going to want to until you start the kissing. Uh So until you start all that stuff that would tend to get her excited, she isn't going to (laughs) know if she Uh -uh. wants to go, if she wants to go further tonight or not. And, and, and so we need to value kissing and touch and we need to see it not as always having to lead to sex. Because if you're a more spontaneous person married to a more responsive person, and every time you start kissing, Mm. you're upset if it doesn't lead to sex, the responsive person will stop kissing too, Mm -hmm. because they don't want to get into that position. And Mm -hmm. this is often when things get really sexless. So the more that the spontaneous person can let their spouse say, okay, no, I've, I've tried, but it's just not going to work for me tonight. Uh-huh. Then <laughs> the more likely it will work on other nights. <laughs> yes. Yes. Love it. So it's not a yes or no. It's like a maybe get into yeah. the maybe space yeah. and learn to live in that world. So just yeah. always mm-hmm. is it yes or no. Yeah. Good. Good. It takes a lot of maturity for guys though, to be able to start and then say, well, it's not going to happen and be okay with that. Especially yeah. if they have, as I said earlier, this entitlement mindset. Mm-hmm. And so we need to be, at, we need to be developing our emotional maturity that we can be at that level. We can do that. Yeah. And we just need to value non-sexual touch in general. Yeah. Like just, just being close physically touching each other with no strings attached. Mm-hmm. So important. Yeah. And what I also often tell women who have a more responsive libido is, you know, ladies, if you do enjoy sex, if you do reach orgasm, when you do have sex, if this is tends to be a good experience for you, then it's okay to just say, I'm not feeling it right now, but I'm pretty confident that I will if we start. And so I'm just going to start, like, I'm going to initiate, I'm just going to jump in because I want, I deserve to feel amazing. And so instead of, instead of waiting for your body to say, yes, I want this, you can start telling your body, you know, this is going to feel good. So let's just go for it. (laughs) Oh yeah. That's great advice. It's like me going running in the morning when it's cold and dark outside. Yes. I don't want to go, but I put on my shoes anyway. And I go out and a little while later, I'm feeling great. And afterwards I'm so happy I did it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the key there too, is you also know that you can, if you open the door and it's pouring rain and sleet and hail and you go, nope. (laughs) Hey, Mm -hmm. and I think that, so the spouse who is the spontaneous spouse needs to let their resp- responsive libido spouse know that if they do ramp it up and try and then go, yeah, you know what? No, that they're still okay. <laughs> they're going to be all right. <laughs> right. Give them yes. that safe space. Yeah. Yes. All right. As we wrap this up, I want to switch gears a little bit. Let's say you're become a re- you read your book. You're a good lover. You've you got all the romance down. You're really good at initiating and moving into that maybe space and everything like that we talked about. 
And now you want to take things to the next level. What are your black belt sex tips? <laughs> okay, well, I have, I have one. Um, Kegel exercises can okay. really, really help. Um, just learning how to control the pelvic floor muscles. Yeah. Um, and for women, it often helps orgasms become more intense. Um, and just learning how to squeeze. And, and often when you do learn how to control those muscles, then, um, yeah, it, you just often feel at a deeper level. And so, so that can help. And they can also really help men too with control, yes. especially if you want to wait, you know, if you want to hold off a little bit. So doing those exercises, there's lots of, um, Ex- explanations on how to do them. I really want to, I would rather send people to a medical site than explain it myself because it is a medical thing, but, uh-huh. but they're not difficult to do. You can learn how to do them at home super easily. And, and I think that's a great exercise to just improve your health overall too. I'm doing them right now as you talk about <laughs> the TMI, but yeah, <laughs> you can do it. standing, sitting, whatever. Uh-huh. Oh my gosh. So Good. that's, well, I, the first thing is you said, what's your black belt sex tips? My first thought was, oh, that's kind of like got a double entendre there. <laughs> Does it have to involve a black belt? Could it be a red belt? <laughs> oh, you mean karate. Sorry. Oh, leather. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I guess what I would say is, is that um, uh, for guys, the challenge I would say is, is can we make this something that's really good for your wife? Have you ever had a night where it's like, you know what, this is not for me. This is just for you um, because I, I don't think a lot of guys do that. Um, have you ever had a time where you said, we're going to do a lot of stuff, but we're not going to actually have intercourse. We're just going to explore everything else. Um, working on those other aspects of your sexual relationship rather than just focusing on intercourse can just think, think, take things to a totally higher level. We, we talk a lot about that in the book about how sex is not just intercourse. It's everything you do sexually Mm-hmm. to connect to your spouse. And so having a little bit of time where you say, we're not going to, we're going to take it across off the table and we're just going to do these other things to heighten the experience. And especially focusing on her experience, especially if she's a woman who has a hard time with orgasm or hasn't orgasm mm-hmm. um, and saying, you know, there's no pressure here. We're just going to have fun and we're just going to enjoy bodies. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's sort of what I would say. Mm-hmm. Love those tips. Thank you. Very, very mm-hmm. good. Is there anything else you want to add to before we wrap up? Uh, no, I think that, I think, yeah. yeah that was good. Really Wait, very good. Where can people learn more about you and what you do? Okay, so my blog is at to love, honor, and vacuum.com. And there's links to our podcast. We have the Bear Marriage podcast every Thursday. We've got our books there The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex, Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex, uh, The Great Sex Rescue, um, all kinds of other things there. We've got an orgasm course, a libido course. So just head over to to love, honor, and vacuum.com. All my social media links are there, and you can follow the menu to find everything else we have. So there's a lot. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. It's been great to be here. Thanks for inviting us. All right, now for some details about a giveaway. In my hand are copies of The Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex and The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex. This is a book for him and a book for her. So follow us on Instagram at getyourmarriageon.com and you have until May 13th, that's next Thursday, to find our post that has something about this giveaway and this podcast episode. And please comment either with an emoji or something that you've learned from this episode or tag someone else you think might listen to this episode and benefit from it. You know, maybe your significant other that needs this information. Anyway, we will choose a winner and I will ship you these books personally. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of Get Your Marriage On. And if you did, we would love it if you would take a few seconds to give us a rating on iTunes and to share the show with your friends. They'll thank you for life. Once you've done that, you can head over to GetYourMarriageOn.com for more resources about today's topic and to download our amazing marriage apps. Now go get your marriage on.